Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sotastic Podcast. Today we have with us a very special guest. His name is Dr. Deepa Patel. And we're going to be covering a really interesting topic that I, I want to make sure that you get his perspective. But before I do, let me give you a little bit of his background. So Dr. Patel practices family sports and medicine at Yorkville Primary Care and Sports Medicine. And he's a medical director for Rush Copley Sports Medicine in Aurora, Illinois. He's also the director of sports medicine for Rush Copley and assistant professor at uh, Rush Medical College in Chicago. And over and above that, he has authored, mentored, and served as a section editor for several publications and textbooks on sports medicine topics. In fact, in 2020, Dr. Patel was the editor and author for the book, Concussion Management in Primary Care, Evidence-Based Answers to Cases and Questions. And so he has been invited several times to serve on the medical review panel for the AAFP's FamilyDoctor.org, and he's a frequent editor for Dynamed Plus. So welcome, Deepak. How are you today? Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for thank you for being on. Yeah. So I know over and above all the things we talked about for introduction. Why don't we learn a little bit more about you, your family, your professional life? So my family, uh, I'm married to my best friend. We've known each other for several years, and she shares my passion for the same career in that she's a physician as well. She is a pediatrician, and that's probably the the one difference for me. Um, We have a lovely daughter. Her name is Karishma. Additional things I can tell you, my family life. I have a brother. He also is in the medical field. His um, interests and training was in chiropractic so he's a chiropractic physician and medicine has been kind of in our household if you will yeah yeah I, I know your parents were i uh, have a medical background can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah so i was fortunate both my parents were physicians okay. um, but interestingly they had trained in several countries and unfortunately with that years of training they never really practiced together hmm. um, that was always i think a goal of theirs but it never worked out that way okay. um, but in the process i think they learned a lot they showed us several different countries and kind of taught us how to advance yourself in a career and continue to grow and learn. Now, were they practicing medicine completely through their careers in U.S.? Were they practicing someplace else? Or were they- yeah, so they started off in India okay. and then they went to the United Kingdom, so England, and both completed some training there as well. Mm. And then we moved to Canada mm. before coming to the U.S. Which I know, at least I would love to circle back on, because you decided to pursue medical career, but you also decided to study it actively internationally abroad, right? So we're going to circle back on if that played any role or not. But uh, let me ask you this. Did you always want to go into the medical field? Like, what got you interested? So that's kind of interesting. I think we were told as children that Listen, you have two parents who are physicians. It should be a simple road to kind of get to that. Um, That was the career that my parents said they could help us with in terms of mentoring or guiding us. But I never really developed my passion for it until I was in high school. Hmm. And so for me, I would say the beginning or the spark for me was my father convinced me to do a CPR class. Okay. And when we did the CPR class, my brother and I both took it. After we were done, we lived in a small town, and they said, well, now that you have a CPR card, you could actually work on the ambulance service. Oh, wow. And I was still in high school, which for me initially was quite terrifying to think that I might take someone critically hurt. But my first ambulance call was actually transporting one of my father's patients to the bigger hospital. Okay. And so I spent 45 to an hour in the back of the ambulance with this patient, and I just enjoyed that. And Mm. that was really the spark for me. Uh, And then throughout high school, moving on further, the ambulance really served as a a role for me to see how I could serve, volunteer, help my community, mm -hmm. and how important healthcare could be for people. Wow. And so that started a lot of it. Um, From the CPR course and just volunteering on the ambulance service, I became an EMT, so emergency medical technician. I advanced into uh, intermediate level as well as at some point, both my brother and I did certified nursing assistant training. Okay, wow. So, and we worked um, with those certifications as well. So, wow. my experience started kind of from the ground up, knowing that my parents kind of geared me or had aspirations that we would enter into physician world, so. 
Well, obviously, medical profession is known for just heavy, heavy schooling up front many years. Did you know going in that you were ready for however many years of schooling you had to do? Yes, that part I knew. And then again, watching my parents, um, they described over and over how they took board exams in several different countries. Mm -hmm. And had they bypassed those other countries and moved just to the U.S., maybe they wouldn't have done so many mm. exams and had to start over in their trainings. Mm. But I saw the commitment it took and I saw the dedication that it was asked of them and how it really helped them become better physicians and people as well. Wow. Okay. So when you were deciding to pursue your studies, uh, you had the option to study in U.S. or you could study abroad. How did you go about deciding to look at international medical schools, which is the path that you ultimately took. Did you seek advice from someone who had already gone that route? Did you uh, do a lot of research, like helping to change that the mindset? Yeah, so this was several years ago before we had as much information available on the internet. But for me, early in college, I was actually quite discouraged by college. Okay. When I left high school, knowing what I wanted to do, I felt like I was just kind of treading water in college, mm. learning the basic sciences and biology and chemistry without really a focus on what was going to lead to my career. And that was the college here? College here. Where did you start college here? So I started college at Loyola University in Chicago. Okay. I think that experience really propelled me to actually pursue international education because I lived with my brother who was a couple of years older than me okay. and we had several roommates and they were all older than me as well. So I saw them struggling, applying later on into college, applying for medical school or fearing they wouldn't be able to get into medical school mm -hmm. and how they were starting to already discuss alternate careers, whether it be dentistry, optometry, pharmacy, mm -hmm. international schools. So I saw this early in college and I really thought, geez, I'm going to get a four-year bachelor's degree in biology, maybe a minor in psychology. And what am I going to do with that if mm -hmm. I don't get into medical school? Mm -hmm. So I started looking into my other options at that point. Okay. And I really knew I wanted to study medicine. I wanted to be on that path that I knew was going to lead to me being in medicine and being a physician. Okay. Well, I started looking around, and my parents helped me with that. Okay. They talked to friends of theirs as well. And we got in touch with someone else who had gone into Europe. We had known people who had gone to the Caribbean for medical okay. school as well. Correct. And then several people we had known had gone to India. Okay. So those were the options that it were pretty clear. Mm. Now, the Caribbean required a bachelor's degree, so I would have had to finish college and then maybe consider that later. Okay. Another alternative to traditional medical school was osteopathic medical schools. Okay. They weren't as popular when I was starting out, um, but they were growing in popularity in terms of their breadth of care and scope and okay. availability and uh, et cetera. My wife is an osteopathic physician, so she chose that route as well. And okay. We can speak to that in a little bit as well. Mm. But when we talk about the different options, when I talked to family friends who had gone through these different routes, I was torn actually down to then just India versus Europe where I went. Okay. Because as I said, the Caribbean typically required a bachelor's degree mm. and then it was going to be four years of medical similar to what the program would be here. Okay. Okay. So my options were India or Europe. As I looked into the India programs, my concern was I hadn't lived in India ever in my life. Mm. And I'm not sure how comfortable I would have felt living there. Mm. Other aspects of their training, it required a year and a half semesters or terms. Okay. And they didn't, at that time, the schools I was looking at didn't really require any testing or regular verification of knowledge uh, okay. until the end of that year and a half term. Okay. And I feared that all of my studying would come down to the month prior to that year and a half. And I didn't feel like I was going to... That was the optimal environment for me. Okay. Europe did semesters, so six months at a time or four to six months at a time. I felt that was a little bit better, mm. um, although this was going to be a foreign land, new language, new living experience. I wouldn't have any of the comforts of home okay. that I've come to expect or know. So I applied to the... Europe programs. Okay. And once I was accepted, I thought, geez, this is kind of simple. Mm. I get to finally pursue the training I want to do, the education I want, get the degree I've always wanted. Did Europe require, you said, no bachelors from Correct. the US? Yeah. So was that part of their program to provide sure. that? Yeah. So if you didn't have a bachelor's degree, the way they did it is they had a six year program. 
Okay. So instead of the four years for college that it traditionally would be and then four years for medical school, mm. that would be similar to the U.S. model or the Caribbean model. Okay. India was, I believe, five and a half years at the time. Okay. So, you know, they were five and a half, so they didn't require a bachelor's degree either. Okay. And Europe was six years. There are some other medical schools in Europe that do a similar four-year program, mm. especially for people who already had that okay. bachelor's degree. Can you help me understand the cost aspect? And is there a wide variance in cost in studying in Europe versus India versus the Caribbeans? So at the time when I was looking at India, they had more of a financial-based seat where you provide a donation, as far as I was aware. Okay. That was a lump sum up front. I don't remember the exact dollar mm -hmm. amount, but it was quite expensive. Okay. The European model was pay by semester. Okay. There was an expectation that each semester you could, or not an expectation, but there was a understanding that we could earn merit scholarships for subsequent semesters. Okay. So that actually made it very financially rewarding. When I look back, the way we purchased six months semesters at a time, mm. if your prior semester you had a GPA above 4.0 out of 5, mm. you received a 25% tuition reduction oh, wow. on your subsequent semester. And I remember you mentioning that, which... I. It incentivizes you to actually study, make sure you're up on your game. That's exactly right. So there was that financial incentive. But it went even further. If you were above 4.5 out of 5, you received 35% off of your tuition. Okay. And that wasn't necessarily my goal, mm. especially early on. Mm. A lot of these other programs do kind of have weed out years in the first couple of years mm. to see who's truly interested. So a lot of, maybe it's just the demands of it, just mm. a lot harder in the first couple of years. Okay. And we could see a steadily decline in the number of students. Okay. You would start out with classes of 100, 150. Mm. They would drop each year by 20% mm. um, until you got to third or fourth year. Now, those were also the more clinical years, so they were a little more interesting, too. Mm. So the people who could stick it out that far could then enjoy learning a little bit more clinical stuff. Mm. Okay. Can you help me understand? Uh, I'm sure you must have looked at scholarships or grants or something. Were there options available if you were going from U.S. to Europe to study? So I did look into that. At the time, I couldn't find anything about that. The only thing financial aid-wise, the school I attended was approved by the U.S. Department of Education. So I was able to take out federal loans for that. Oh, really? Okay. And that really helped me build a little more confidence in the program I was going to. Yes. That if they recognize it as a school. There's credibility we, there. We had heard of some pop-up schools that would just kind of pop up all of a sudden and really weren't planning to be around for very long. Mm. And they were trying to tap into this resource of people who wanted to just attend a medical school mm. and then they might fold or they lost credentialing or they lost their standing with the U.S. Department of Education. Mm. So I think that's the advice I give people. If it's a school I've never heard of, just make sure it does have some of that credibility. Mm. It has a little more time and years of being around and plans to continue being around. Okay. As you and I have talked in the past, the tuition was much lower mm. than any school here. Mm. My medical school tuition was a third of what my college tuition was. Wow. And then if you factor in the merit scholarships throughout the year, mm. I saved quite a bit of money. Okay. As I also mentioned, I saved a year of my life because had I done a traditional four years of college, four years of medical school, that would be eight years. I did one year of college and six years of medical school. Got it. Okay. So it did also fast track my career by a year as well. Oh, wow, okay. That's something that I'm, I'm going to definitely circle back on. I did want to just ask you a follow-up question. You mentioned the Department of Education has like a list of schools that they that you can get financial aid. As far as you're aware, is it same type of financial aid coverage? Do you sacrifice anything in using financial aid internationally versus here? Is like 100% covered? Do they give a lesser amount as far as you know? At least back then, I think you could take the full loan amount. Mm -hmm. And as I said, my cost was much lower mm -hmm. But I still took full amount in loans. So mm. that was supposed to account for the cost of living that might have been different. Okay. Here again, the cost of living where I was at was even lower. Oh, okay, uh, Significantly nice. lower than what I was paying here. Okay. So I took the full loan amounts. I didn't necessarily need that full amount mm. because the costs were much lower. But I think just being credentialed or at least approved it allows you to take a full loan, okay. as far as I understand, unless the rules have changed. So we talked about the amount of years and the differences between the different countries, different uh, regions. Then we talked about the cost. 
What about the quality? Was there a success ratio that these medical schools would publish? So I don't think they necessarily did. And in talking to some of the other people who had attended there, they would tell you, you could ask them, how did you do on your board exams? Mm -hmm. So we were required, having trained abroad, you are required to take board exams as well as people who are trained here. Mm -hmm. There was an additional board exam that was slightly different for international graduates. And those numbers aren't specifically published. Okay. Now they probably are, but mm -hmm. back then they weren't. I looked at it as if it was like most standardized tests. I think mm -hmm. if you applied yourself, you put, uh, dedicated enough time to do it, it was still doable. Mm -hmm. The pass rate, I did know some friends who weren't had some difficulties passing okay. and had to take multiple attempts. It is probably true that some of our training was not specifically geared toward passing those exams, whereas I'm familiar that most Caribbean schools, they are geared toward making sure you do well on those board exams. There is some incentive for them too, because they are going to advertise those numbers. Okay. Whereas international schools are more content with graduating physician, okay. making them knowledgeable and reaching their expectations or benchmarks as opposed to just the U.S. board exam. Okay. So when you were truly comparing India versus Europe, which was your final two choices, I'm sure there was anxiety over you uh, having uh, an Indian background in family. I'm sure there was a little bit of comfortability factor there that I know you didn't grow up in India, but like maybe food, the language. How did you have to determine that between that and Europe? Yeah, I, I actually didn't even take that into account. Mm -hmm. If I looked at the lifestyle, I figured the weather in Europe I could handle you know, quite well. Yeah. Um, the weather in in India, I was a little more concerned about. I don't tolerate the heat as well. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so I was a little concerned about how that would fa factor out. But beyond that, the language, I knew I was going to have to work on another language skill, whether I was in India or, mm. or in Europe. Okay. Food, yes, it was probably easier in India. Food was definitely a big issue for me in Europe mm. as I'm vegetarian and they're concept of vegetarian was not anything more than uh, what I would call rabbit food. <laughs> okay, so. okay. Which I hope uh, has since changed. I hope so too. But. <laughs> so you ultimately decided to go the Europe path, right? Did you have to do anything in preparation to go there? I think the big thing was planning. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a chance to go visit there, see what I would need and right. then come back. I didn't have a lot of people kind of guiding me. You're going to need to pack this, this and this. Um, when I was interviewing, there were a group of people that I met, and mm -hmm. so we were able to converse and at least have some familiarity with somebody that was going to land in the same place I was. Mm -hmm. But truly, I was on the plane by myself and landed by myself. I had to figure it out as I went along. Mm -hmm. It presented its own challenges, yeah. especially the first day in a foreign country. Was there a mindset going there that, listen, I mean, this is it, no going back? Or was it like, you know what, if this doesn't work out, there is always plan B. Yeah, I don't think I ever thought that there was a plan B. I think I felt like this was it. There mm -hmm. were some nights where I said, why am I doing this, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. where you're a little bit lonely, homesick, whatever it might be. Right. And the work's piling up and you're, you're getting stressed and it's, it's a little more challenging. But I, I never really felt like, all right, I have another option I want to pursue next. Okay. I think that's where my parents were helpful even later on through the years when the, the workload was more demanding. Mm -hmm. My parents were not as much into directing me what to do. Okay. But I remember what my father said is, if we did this, there's no reason you couldn't do this. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good confidence builder. Yeah. And the more I thought about it, if they were equipped with the skill set mm -hmm. to absorb this information, to apply this information and learn all this information, why can't I be? And so instead of thinking that I couldn't do something, I had to figure out how I could. Hmm. So that was really helpful. Did you have any other acquaintances or anybody else that you knew from US that also was there at the same time as you were? When I got there, yes. When we got there, many of the friends we made were US hmm. natives. There are, the beauty of the programs are they're English speaking programs in European or foreign countries. Okay. And so you have people from all over the world. Mm. So I made friends with people from Norway. Mm. I had friends from Africa. Uh, there were some who came from directly from India even. Okay. Canada, like I said, the US. There were some people from Iran, mm. Saudi Arabia. So uh, quite a wide variety. 
Okay. Is it fair to say that you did not know anyone there prior to going there? Just the people I had met during my interview process. I, so okay. that was one day of meeting them, and that was pretty much it. Wow. Um, the other people we had talked to prior to even applying, they were much further along in their career, mm-hmm. and they had actually attended different school than I actually had. So mm-hmm. I didn't have any direct knowledge. Just hearing you talk about it, you know, as I'm sure you were safe assuming uh, either early 20s or, mm-hmm. right? So you were like right at that path where you're figuring yourself out. Yeah, I was 19. 19, okay. Did you find a lot of people similar to your mindset at the school that said, hey, uh, there's no risk here for international studying versus studying at the native countries, wherever they were from? Yeah, I think a lot of them were in a similar boat. They, They saw the writing on the wall that they may not be able to become a physician in their home countries mm. for whatever reason, whether they just weren't able to afford it, mm. couldn't qualify for it, had done poorly at some point in their training, and still wanted to pursue this career. Okay. okay. So we, we all did share that kind of mentality. Mm. It, interestingly, I learned that a lot of Scandinavian countries, for example, have still a high demand for physicians, okay. but they have limited seats in their medical schools as well. Ah, okay, okay. For them, it was even more of a cost to come to the school I was at. Okay. Because some of it or most of it was subsidized if they stayed within. Mm-hmm. And then some of the Scandinavian countries were actually even sponsoring them to actually attend a medical school as long as they were going to come back. Okay. Does Department of Education publish like a ranking of any sort of schools i'm not aware of that okay because when somebody's deciding i'm sure they have let's say if they choose europe as an example i'm sure they have several schools to Mm -hmm. choose from how do you choose that one specifically sure that was the only one i had heard of Mm -hmm. so you know we spoke to as i said family friends went through an interview process after we contacted someone Mm -hmm. At that time, there was an organization that would help to kind of match you into certain programs. Okay. The nice part about it is then they flew professors over here to the U.S. to do the interviewing. Oh, As wow. opposed to me having to find them. And so they assisted with some of that. Hmm. So they were almost like an agent, if you will. Okay. Um, to help with some of that process. Okay. Now, since then, and since I started, multiple different schools in Europe have kind of popped up for English speaking or international students. Okay. In Europe where I was at within the country I was at, I after I was there I heard of two or three other schools that also had separate English speaking programs or international okay. programs. Okay. So they flew out professors for your interview process. Can you help me understand that interview process? What was that like? What were some of the questions that you were presented, some of the questions you may have asked? Just to feel a little bit more comfortable around that decision. Wow. I have to think back. I think at the time they had asked me what kind of experience I had in medicine, what made me interested in it, as you already asked, as well as things that I may have done in my career that may lead me to want to pursue medicine. Hmm. Okay. So those are the parts I remember. Were there questions that you asked of them to figure out differences of them versus U.S.-based? Sure, yeah. So I asked about kind of the testing process, Mm -hmm. whether it was going to be multiple choice, oral exams, if there was periodic testing, just to verify it was on a semester basis or even mid-semester testing. Mm -hmm. I recall asking about just the experience that we could obtain, how much hands-on we could obtain. Mm -hmm. Most of them were very upfront about asking or answering those. Most of the professors that came were professors for the earlier more the science years as opposed to the clinical years Mm. but many of them were medical physicians already Mm. and so they had gone back to teaching some of the more basic science level stuff so looking back now were there any questions you wish you would have asked not really i think i look at it as kind of life experience Mm. there are some things that i didn't expect that probably were challenges but luckily i was able to look at them as challenges and push through any level of preparation i don't know that it really would have made a difference i Mm. think being abroad in itself is a challenge Mm. back then we didn't have as much resources to things it was a challenge but Mm. i think it was something that you could work through now that you look back on it what do you feel are the sort of the pros versus cons yeah absolutely so i see this quite a bit in my career because i've worked alongside U.S.-based physicians. Um, One of my roles is teaching residents Mm. for family medicine. So within that, I get to see even the differences between other international students and U.S. medical students too. So I will say definitely 
one of the strengths of international programs, especially the one I went to in Europe, was quite a bit of emphasis on the basics mm. of getting a good history from a patient, doing a good exam. We were very much tested and grilled on how good is our exam, how good is our thought process for the different possibilities of the diagnoses. Mm. I compare this all the time with my wife, who's a U.S. trained physician. They're much more adept at what tests to order, right? So they're, I guess it's kind of a difference in allocation of resources. Okay. So in Europe, you didn't have the full menu of, you can order all these blood tests and maybe one will give you the answer. Mm. You can order an MRI looking for an answer. One of my professors said, you can order an MRI, it might be two or three years before they get it done. Mm. Whereas here, it's commonplace, you get it within a week or two. Just what do you do with that limited information, limited resources? I think that kind of experience made me a better physician. Instead of knowing what to order, I I was thinking more of what could it be? Mm. How much more do I need to emphasize more questions to the patient? Mm more thinking of all the possibilities mm. and also broadening my examination skills, going back to check on them, going back to push on something and relying on that instead of mm. what I can check boxes to order. Okay. The other part too, I think the difference was we spent a lot more time doing hands-on things. Mm. And unfortunately, I think in the U.S. with more regulation, student roles and student experiences have really been diluted. Mm. I can say even within what I see who, who we're training, here patients aren't as comfortable sometimes having a training, even if it's a resident who's already graduated medical school and is just doing their specialty training. Mm. Some patients aren't comfortable with that. In Europe, that was expected. Okay. They really weren't given a choice in that. Mm. And also, just as a student, the amount of things that I got to do hands-on, whether it was suturing, you know, practicing stitching, putting stitches in, or just reading x-rays and just that kind of hands-on experience. It's a little bit harder here in the U.S. because of, you know, maybe concerns about liability, concerns about Mm. patient consent, um, Mm. And maybe refusals, I guess. Is it fair to say that U.S. approach is more regulatory first? Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and then going down to the patient Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And then if you, we could also get into, you know, is there a difference in practice patterns in people who practice in the U.S. versus internationally? Mm. And I think it would mirror that similar concept, which is U.S. physicians do tend to order more tests for mm. liability concerns patient satisfaction concerns, whereas I think some of the other countries look at more cost-effectiveness of care. Mm. What can you do with less as opposed to what can you order extra? So some of the challenges truly were, okay, you learn to practice in this foreign country. That practice model is different than here. Is it, so, is it that, that different of a model in different countries? It is. If you even look at the basic part, which is note-taking, European standards for or international standards for documentation of physician care is a few lines at best. And I find it comical, even when I visited a family friend in England, he had a six by eight manila card. And he said, this is my patient's visit summary for the last three years. Hmm. We have three pages of Hmm. documentation for every patient visit that comes in to see us. In the US, US. US. yeah, wow. So, you know, that level of detail, they're noting just the pertinent relevant stuff. Hmm. I think it's more kind of the litigious focus that's forced the U.S. physicians to document more. And just the way a note is written, that was different. So I had to work on learning that. Mm. But doing some of the rotations, and that's where even if you're an international student, many times you can have opportunities to do rotations as a student here in the U.S. Okay. And then you can gain some of that other experience. Mm. So if you ask me, the benefit was... Again, I honed my basic skills, Mm. asking the right questions, thinking of all the different possibilities, doing the exam, looking to see how do I mentally filter out all the possibilities for a patient. Mm. And then, geez, if it was a luxury, ordering extra tests. When I came here, then I could learn the other nuances. So during my rotations, I could practice how do they do notes here? Mm. What's some of the verbiage that's used a little differently? We use a lot of acronyms here in the U.S. to Mm. shorten things. Mm. Internationally, they don't use that. Medications go by different names from there versus here Mm. as well. Mm. Those kinds of things were things I was a little more challenged to learn that people here in the U.S. didn't have to bother with. But again, I think I developed a different skill set too. 
Mm, okay. Now, some of the other resources, especially nowadays, students, even in European schools, Caribbean schools, there are more resources, even technology wise, where, you know, anatomy atlases, anatomy labs can be done virtually and digitally and things like that. Mm. So I think that levels the playing field a little bit more. But we had quite a bit of strength in that we could go into a lab we were able we had open access to go to different labs and and work and try to learn Hmm. in those environments could begin again there weren't as many restrictions that way in terms of coming back the testing process is very similar and it's getting more and more aligned interestingly i at the time was required to take a additional test which was test of english as a foreign language the toefl test (laughs) Even though you were born and raised, well, I wasn't. I was born and raised in an English-speaking country. Mm-hmm. I had completed middle and high school in the U.S. I was still required to take that test. Oh wow! Okay. So it was silly. It was an extra, probably a couple hundred dollars, but <laughs> beyond that, it was not something that was obscuring my career. The only other cons, or the other cons, I would think about is that level of experience, that nomenclature, the putting together the notes, mm-hmm. kind of the hands-on day-to-day things that doctors in training which are residents do here Mm -hmm. was something i had to learn so that took some more time the other thing that was a little more challenging and i would caution anyone about is you are going to be considered less competitive as an applicant if you're looking for training in a special field i've never understood that because you're going through similar medically speaking knowledge the actual content may be similar it's just the philosophy difference Yeah, but I think the thought process is that if you're in a competitive field, or Mm. competitive specialty, I should Mm. say, they're more inclined to choose someone who's graduated from certain programs that they're more familiar with Mm. and that they could trust a little bit better. Mm, Okay. When they're that competitive, I think they find other things to kind of use to pick out who they really want. Mm. And that's where I think it's more challenging. Okay. So, for example, if you have someone who's truly interested in doing surgery, some kind of surgical specialty, again, those are highly competitive here in the U.S. Mm. Being an international graduate, that was probably not going to be in my cards or most people's future. It's just much more challenging. Okay. I'm not going to say it's impossible and it hasn't been done. Mm. I have classmates who've done, you know, radiology, which is highly competitive, mm. to even subspecialties in various fields. So it is definitely doable. Knowing what you know now, what would you advise? You know, somebody who's in high school, in their mindset, has an unlimited future, medically speaking, when they study abroad versus studying in the U.S. I think if they plan to practice in the U.S., the path is a little easier staying here. I think if you're looking for a diverse experience, international definitely offers that. Mm -hmm. I lived in a foreign country. It gives me something to talk to patients about, to relate to this group of people that we were isolated somewhere else and we only had each other. Mm -hmm. So we built that. One of the other pros, I will say, and I think this is true for a lot of things in life, when you are a U.S. medical student, and I see this even amongst students right now, Mm -hmm whether they're international students or U.S. students. For the U.S. students, most of their curriculum and most of their experience is already kind of structured for them. So there's less anxiety, fears, creativity even, Mm -hmm. in terms of how are they going to complete what they're doing. Mine being abroad, they weren't concerned about what kind of rotations I'm going to do in the U.S. and how would I get them. Mm -hmm. So that forced me to take on a lot more initiative calling hospitals, finding out, well, I could do this during that month when I'm free Mm. and it'll qualify. And there's a little more legwork. Mm. And you could say, well, that's a lot more hassle. Yeah, but again, I think it it made me into who I am Mm. in terms of having that initiative, being Mm. able to kind of be a little more creative with my schedule and looking out for more opportunities and where else could I find an opportunity as Mm. opposed to everything being laid out and structured for me. Mm -hmm. So maybe it drove a little more ambition for me. And I think I see that with some of the other graduates from U.S. versus international. There's a little difference in terms of, well, I need to just get through this because this is what's required of me now versus I'm really interested in this and I I really want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's kind of unique to see. And it truly is difference in training and maybe a little difference in philosophy, but... Mm -hmm. Many of the U.S. students know they will have some kind of training program to come back to. International graduates don't have that. So whether you call that a challenge, a chip on their shoulder, Mm. a a push for more ambition and drive, Mm. 
you could look at it in multiple different ways. Mm. But I think many of them do f- see that and feel that. And mm. I think it makes a difference. Even when I look at beyond just training-wise, mm. into practice, again, I think if your, your training was you need to match these steps and you'll be fine, mm. I think you get lulled into that sense of complacency. Mm. Whereas if you've had to kind of fight for things, you've had to be challenged, you've had to figure out how to do things a little bit more on your own, you know, similar to what you guys talk about is some of the struggles, failing things, not getting what you needed at the time, those build character, those build resilience, those mm-hmm. build initiative and, and desire. Those are good qualities too. So, uh, placing myself in your shoes, I feel is a very brave decision because you're in a country where I'm sure you don't have any relatives. No. Being comfortable with potentially learning a different language. Totally. Food, as you mentioned, for sure. Just cultural differences. And this is not just go there and try it. It's like, hey, you're stunning. You have a deadline of six years. If you don't do as well as you'd like, you're going back with a lot more to lose. I applaud that. I know a lot of people that I'm sure just with what you've shared, you've made them comfortable with that decision. And Let me were, expand if I can yes, add please. some humor to kind of the first few days yes. of being abroad. I still recall my first night. So I had numbers of the friends that I met and even after the first couple of days had their home phone numbers. Mm. I didn't have a phone connected in my apartment yet. So I wanted to go to a pay phone. I didn't have change. Okay. So I had some bills. <laughs> I went to the grocery store went up to the cash register and I'm pointing at the cash register and I could not figure out how to ask for change. <laughs> and I kept totally. showing bills and I'm not sure if the clerk felt like I wanted to rob them, <laughs> what I wanted from them, but I kept trying to point to the cash register just to get change to make a phone call to call my friend. Wow. And the other first meal I had in my own apartment was I went to the grocery store. Again, I couldn't read the labels in the mm-hmm. foreign language. And being vegetarian, I didn't want to buy something that had meat in it. Right. So I had I boiled some peas and some macaroni uh, and put some butter on it, and that was my first meal. Wow, okay. I'm hoping that's since changed and there's has, more yeah. westernized restaurants. Absolutely. And I saw the change even the time I was there. Mm. But early on, and again, it was, it was tough at the time. Mm. But looking back on it, it was a valuable experience. Yeah, an adventure. It was an adventure. Well, yeah. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on board spending the time with us and enlightening us thank you for having me it's been an honor if i can just add i'm really excited about being here just because i was really excited about the work you guys do at sotastic i have to say my daughter's not old enough to do your your courses yet in your program but when i heard that you do something like this to really provide that financial literacy for children which i think is amazing and i hope more people take advantage of your sort services I can't wait for my daughter to be on Sotastic.com and to actually learn from those modules. So I'm looking forward to her having that opportunity. And thank you for what you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The ideas, techniques, approaches, information, and opinions expressed in this video or podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Sotastic LLC and its employees. While the primary purpose is to educate and inform, it does not constitute professional advice or services. We hope, however, that the content presented here will assist you in developing a strong financial understanding and mindset. You may not edit, modify, copy, or redistribute this video or podcast with any other website, computer, or playing device. Use of this video or podcast constitutes acceptance of these terms. All content of this video or podcast is subject to copyright international law. No private or public means or blog or website can repost or reproduce or modify and post its content without the written consent of Sotastic LLC.